This may be a congressional investigation situation, may fall to armed services. You sit on that committee. What role does Congress have to play in this story? Well, we should be asking ourselves who was keeping watch. Here was a young kid, a 21-year-old, who had access to classified information, maybe the largest classified leak in our in recent history. And where was the leadership? So I support an investigation on House Armed Services or on House Oversight, both committees that I sit on today to get more information about how this happened. And I want to know, I think like every other American, was who was in charge? And each side right now, one side's calling him a traitor, the other side's calling him a hero, but neither side has the information or the data to be able to make that decision yet because there's been no investigation. And we haven't even had our first classified briefing, which will happen later this week when we're back in session. Yeah, and he'll be back in court too. Um, there's also this issue of how long these documents were percolating out there on the internet. Wall Street Journal editorial board says this, it's fair to ask how the documents could circulate for weeks on Discord and other platforms without U.S. counterintelligence agents finding out until the press reported it. Is this another case of misplaced priorities by the Federal Bureau of Investigation? So that back end part of the story, who's to blame for the lengthy time it took for us to discover this? Well, at the end of the day, ultimately, it'll be DOD and the Pentagon who will be to blame for this. But the other question is the leadership on the ground that this young man worked for. How the heck did he, was he able to take classified documents, it sounds like, out of a skiff, take pictures of them, take them home, take pictures of them and put them on Discord? Uh, it's crazy to think that this was happening. And it's clear that, that no one was watching where this young man was working and what he was doing. All right, we'll dig into that more later on the show, but I want to talk about these controversial issues now that the GOP is dealing with. Um, you saw Lucas's reporting there about the NRA, all the big stars, the people who are in the running for 2024 or maybe um, showed up there. And this comes uh, amidst, as The Hill puts it, uh, among the shadow of another round of mass shootings. And again, overnight, we're tracking this one out of Alabama. The Hill says this, it puts Republicans in a tricky position as they juggle aligning themselves on key issues that bode well amongst their base while risking alienating another block of voters that have been proven that they can make or break critical elections. Where does this conversation about guns go now? Well, we need to have this conversation. I will tell you, every mass shooting, we just there's just silence, and there's th prayers are offered, Easter baskets are offered, but no real solutions. And I'm a constitutional conservative, but I'll tell you, Shannon, about a week ago, my kids and I were a mile away from a mass shooting in South Carolina, where six people were shot. We saw the immediate aftermath of that shooting, all the police cars and EMS. And the first thing my kids asked me in moments after that shooting, they said, hey, mommy, where is the Amber Alert to let us know that we're near a mass shooting and maybe we should have taken cover or maybe not left the house so that we could be safe? And Republicans can no longer be silent on this issue. And it's not about the Second Amendment. There are plenty of things that we can be doing besides offering prayers and silence. Some sort of amber alert, for example, to let the community know there's been a shooting. Strengthening our background checks is something that the vast majority of Americans support. Hardening our schools, churches, and synagogues so that there is deterrence, so that when a shooter, potential mass shooter, enters a place, that they know that maybe they're not going to make it through because there's bulletproof doors, bulletproof windows. Uh, you know, it, those kinds of common sense things are all things that every American on either side of the aisle can get behind. But yet, every time there's a mass shooting and they're increasing every year, every week, we just, we don't say anything, we want to bury our heads in the sand and hope that it goes away. But guess what? It's not going away. And I see it. I'm in a very purple district, even though I'm in South Carolina. It is an issue that continues to be a problem for Republicans, and we've not learned anything from the midterm elections if we're going to sit here on our hands silently, not offering any type of solution to reduce gun but, violence in our country. And it's not you, about gun control. What would you say, though, about, I mean, there was bipartisan legislation that got through and got to the president's desk last year. I mean, there are places where there have been incremental changes. Um, John Cornyn, you know, one of the chief negotiators of that, one of the top Republicans over in the Senate. So. I don't know that there is uh, an appetite. You talk about hardening targets, but a lot of people on the left will say, don't talk about that. We don't care about that. That's not going to really work. It's only about the guns. I mean, is there any common ground for this on Capitol Hill right now? With the vast majority of Americans, there's common ground. Now, both sides, whether we're talking about abortion or gun violence, both sides tend to dig their heels in and not offer any middle ground. 
I've been working on gun violence issues for a number of years as a state lawmaker and now as a member of Congress, and I'm trying to show a way that we can do that. One of the other issues we have on strengthening our background checks is that we have all these databases at the federal and state level that are all over the place. There's not one piece of software where you can merge all that information together to know in 60 seconds whether or not this is a bad guy trying to buy a gun. It doesn't have to be complicated, but we need to show leadership on sensitive issues because these are issues that motivate our constituencies and voters, especially independent voters. And well, Shannon, quite frankly, Republicans haven't won the majority, the popular vote, in years when it comes to the presidency. And that's something we need to work on and do better. And this is an issue that we can win on. Yeah. And I think that um, it's clear that you think one of the issues the party is not doing well on is this issue of abortion as well. You say that you're right. pro-life. I want to read how the Susan B. Anthony pro-life America list has you. They say, yes, you voted largely pro-life. But confusingly, she's also publicly denounced certain protections for unborn children and undermined thoughtful strategy of pro-life members of Congress who are working to push back against the extremism of pro-abortion members of Congress. So how do you define pro-life? Where do you set the limits? Where would you set restrictions and exceptions? What's your position? I find... I find it ironic that Susan B. Anthony would attack me. I'm a victim of rape. I advocate for women who've been raped, and that organization will no longer talk to my office about pro-life legislation because I'm talking about birth control. I mean, some of these groups have gotten so over the top and extreme. We need to find a middle ground on this issue, and I have a great pro-life voting record, but some of the stances we've taken, especially when it comes to rape and incest, protecting the life of the mother, it's so extreme, the middle, the independent voters, right of center, left of center, they cannot support us. And again, I represent a purple district. I talked to a voter the other day, and she left the Republican Party of this issue. She's an independent voter. She's pro-choice. Her gestational limits, for example, are at 14 weeks. I'm a pro-life legislator. I'm at 15 to 20 weeks. And so there's a lot of middle ground. I think it's important in how we talk about mm -hmm. these issues and offer solutions. We've got 14 counties in South Carolina that don't have a single OBGYN doctor. So if we're going to ban abortion, what are we doing to make sure women have access to birth control? What are we doing about how do we improve adoption services in our country? What about the kids that are not wanted? What about our foster care system? What about getting nurses that can treat women who need, you know, OBGYN care in those rural areas? What are we doing about getting birth control over the counter at pharmacies? There are a lot of things that we can do to protect life and not alienate the independent voter. Okay, and so that's what Susan B. Anthony's list misses. Okay. Okay, and to my understanding, they have no problem with birth control. For them, it's the issue of abortion. I want to put a, a couple of Gallup polls here um, to look at where Americans are on this issue, because we hear that a majority of this country is pro-choice, tipping that way in the last few years. But here are some recent polling about whether it should be legal, legal only under certain circumstances. That's 50 percent of Americans, another 13 percent illegal in all circumstances. So there are people who clearly have issues. When you look at the trimester framework, by the time you hit the second trimester, a majority of Americans in this poll here, Gallup, 55 percent of them say that they think abortion should be illegal. So that's hitting that 13 week point. Here's what Senator Graham mm -hmm. said about how this is being handled last week on Fox News Sunday. If you're pro-life, you need to explain what that means. Here's what it means to me. I want to protect as many babies as possible. I want exceptions for pregnancies as a result of rape, incest. If the life of the mother is in jeopardy, then the family can decide. I do believe in common sense restrictions on abortion. That's where America's at. The democratic solution when it comes to abortion is taxpayer-funded abortion up to the moment of birth. That's barbaric. That's like China. That's like North Korea. So he's among others who say that Republicans are failing because they aren't clearly articulating their positions and they're not clearly articulating the Democrats' positions either. Is that fair? I would, I, would, I would agree with that. I think that's fair. But what I saw, also what I saw last year in the midterm elections, I saw us lose seats we should have won. I actually made this issue a cornerstone of my campaign. I actually had an ad about rape, talking about exceptions, because I wanted voters to know where I stood on the issue. I've written op-eds. I've done a number of interviews. I've made very clear what my position is. And rather than winning by one point, which is what I won by two years ago when I first came to Congress, I ended up winning by... 14 points because I clearly articulated where I was on the issue and even though I'm pro-life I represent a pro-choice district and I saw the tide change 
after Roe was overturned. We went mildly pro-choice to being vast majority of voters being pro-choice after pro v. Wade. It changed the entire electoral environment in 22, and I will tell you, Based on Senator Graham's comments and some of the positions I've taken, we have not learned our lesson from the midterm election. But you're saying you can't embrace the abortion, abortion issue and talk about it and still win. You talked about increasing your margin there. Is it just that you think GOP mm -hmm. lawmakers and candidates are not articulating this carefully or should they stay away from the issue altogether? They should not stay away from it. They should be vocal and articulate where exactly they stand okay. to try to find that middle ground. Because when you're talking about rape and incest, the vast majority of people absolutely mm -hmm. agree. When you're talking about a 15-week ban, most people agree with that, that as well. And so birth control, these are all things that women support, women are watching. But mm -hmm. instead, it seems like and feels like we're burying our heads in the sand. And every time I stick my head out and I take a position, I take it very publicly, Republicans will call me privately, and then I say, well, what bill can we do? Do you want to do with me? Mm -hmm. What press conference? And then there's silence. It's crickets, and it's tone deaf. And we're afraid of the issue because we're afraid of our base, And but that's not where the base is. I mean, I won my primary last year. I was, I would argue, the only person that beat President Trump in a primary. I won it by nine points, and this has been my position all along. I have not changed who I am. I've stood, I've stood my ground on my principles and my beliefs, and, and we won resoundingly.